It provides the magical thrust that gets people to the stars in the expanse. Let's do the science of the Epstein Drive. The Epstein Drive is the magical rocket engine that gets people from one place to another in the expanse. We don't really know that much about it, uh, not factually anyway, but the showrunners have shared a few details as well as the author. We know that it was developed about 150 years ago based on a previous engine drive and that it mostly runs, according to the authors, on efficiency. Now they said that tongue in cheek, I don't blame them. Trying to project future technology like this is always a bit of a dicey prospect, so getting those showrunners to talk specifically specifically about the science that doesn't exist, well, why bother? So they just talk that it's some efficient process that we haven't achieved today, so we'll call it future science. But even given that, we can speculate a little bit about what the drive is and what it must contain and how it must operate, and we'll do a little bit of that today. So first, let's take what we know about the drive. We know that the drive runs on some sort of fusion, and what exactly that is, that can vary depending on the type of fusion. This isn't gonna be a tutorial on what fusion is, but we'll talk a little bit about the possibilities of that here shortly. But we know that it's run some sort of fusion is backing it uh, ultimately. We also know that it's capable of about 15 G of acceleration. We've seen that in the show. And in the books, we've seen up to 30 Gs of acceleration. Now we don't know how long it can keep it up, but we know that it's just not short person that can keep it up longer than the people can, uh, can survive it. Plus, we know that regularly these drives propel ships around the solar system uh, from about 1G to normally about a third of a G, and I'll get to what that means in a minute. But there's no indication that they're doing that because of fuel consumption. They mostly seem to be doing that because of comfort in the crew, strain on the ship, and strain on the engine. We know that, as they said, it's highly efficient, which makes sense. There's no fuel tanks associated with the ships, at least not big ones like you would see on a space shuttle or some sort of solid or liquid fuel. And we know that it's some sort of plasma that comes out of the exhaust based on what it did to the protomolecule warrior. All right, so that's what we know. Everything else is really just speculation. We can make some uh, reasonable speculations and we can make some leaps here. One of the primary things we don't know is what kind of fusion it is. And that only matters because the byproducts of fusion reactions really vary widely depending on what material is being fused. Generally speaking, fusion produces three types of byproducts, only one of which is generally useful to us right now. The first is plasma in the form, and that's heat, which mostly we derive electricity from. For so that's mostly the useful form of byproduct we get from a fusion reaction. The other two, though, are neutrons, so neutronic radiation, which are these gigantic particles that come off of the, um, the atoms as they're being fused, and they can do quite a bit of damage to materials around them. They're not ionizing radiation, but they are quite destructive. So they can damage DNA, they can damage inorganic material quite a bit. That's a bit of a problem with different types of fusion. And there's also energized radiation that comes of a, off of it, usually in the form of X-ray or gamma ray, again, dependent on on the type of fuel being burned. Again, we don't know the type of fusion here, but we can assume that all three of those byproducts are produced by this reaction in one way or another. So let's move on to some of our assumptions. Now, we don't know exactly what's producing the thrust. In some cases, they've speculated a fusion drive could directly take the plasma of a fusion reaction and use that as a drive fuel, but we're pretty sure that that's not the case here in the expanse because even at very high energy yields, the amount of thrust produced by a, a direct fusion reaction probably wouldn't be enough to achieve the speeds that we're seeing and the acceleration that we're seeing in the show. So most people assume, as, as, as I have, that there's some sort of secondary reaction going on that's a byproduct of what's coming out of initial fusion reaction. Now that might be a whole other fusion reaction that's dirtier and produces more thrust. It might be the catalyzing of some other kind of fuel. Uh, we don't really know. But since it seems to produce plasma as its thrust, we can be sure that it's at least mixed with the plasma of the primary fusion drive or produces plasma on its own. Now the effect of that is that's a gigantic torch that comes off the back of most of these ships. And we've seen them be a little liberal about how they approach landing pads or how they approach stations. And it's hard to say what's going on with the radiation or potential radiation might be there, but there's almost no way to cool, cool plasma comes out of the back. So these would be burning holes in landing pads and burning holes in station if they came at them from the back. So every ship, even if it doesn't have a gun on it, has a very deadly weapon in the form of the engine. And if the reaction produces any sort of considerable neutron radiation or other type of radiation like gamma radiation, then this implies some very advanced future tech to deal with uh, the emissions there and maybe guide it. 
I think it's also safe to assume that we're not dealing with sort of a traditional fuel as we're used to getting to know it. Maybe, uh, and I say that because there's no obvious fuel tanks associated with any ships that we really see in the expanse anywhere. So we're not talking about liquid or solid fuel of some kind that's catalyzed. Now that said, fuel for fusion reactors tend to be these solid pellets that are sort of dense in the space. They're not, they don't take up a lot of space. So that's why I think it's a reasonable assumption to say that the secondary reaction that produces a thrust is also some sort of fusion. Now we have things like breeder reactors and so forth that capture the radiation coming off of fusion reactors to reuse that in some way. Maybe we're looking at some sort of similar engineer here. We're really speculating a lot here though, so I'm not going to go too far, but I think that there's some chain set of reactions, all of which use some sort of fusion reaction to produce that thrust. Another implication of that, although we don't see it frequently in the show, would be that the production of fuel for these fusion reactions is likely to be a massive business in the solar system. We've seen that water is in high demand and is a big business in the solar system, and maybe it's derived from water of some kind, but I don't really know. One mistaken assumption people make is that they're using water, boiled water, to, throw, to move the ships around the solar system. That's probably not happening. They speak to it in the book, they call it this thing called tea kettle, where they do use boiled water as propulsion means, but that's not going to achieve the sort of 1G or 10G acceleration that you're able to see in the show. Sort of a big bit of speculation here. I think that if they were able to achieve some secondary reaction and they were able to capture and direct and utilize these secondary emissions from fusion reactions in some useful way, that could be a big source of energy, especially ones that produce big neutronic radiation. Those are big particles. They can really break other particles around. And uh, the other gamma and X-ray, if they were able to capture that and use it for a secondary reaction, that could be a lot of power. Basically, if they're able to capture near 100% of the energy released from a fusion reaction, they would really have a lot of power at their hands to produce a lot of thrust. So we don't know what this future tech is, but it's certainly capturing most of the energy potential of a fusion reaction and using it as thrust. Now, the real effect of this, though, is how transformative it would be in terms of how we get around the solar system and how accessible space would be for us. The engineering is not something we can talk about, but we know that the speed speeds achieved by this would truly be something that we don't even add into our calculations right now. We have limited solid or liquid fuel rockets that bring things up and then we have to really get creative about how we bleed momentum off of other planets with assisted boosts and all that stuff. So we don't have much to work with out there once we get a ship up in the solar system. But in the world of the Expanse, they can clearly keep a constant thrust for ships, even large ships, over time. And that would open up space in ways we can't even conceive. For instance, if you were to have a ship that with constant 1G acceleration, the trip from Earth on the average distance of Earth to the moon, that would only take somewhere around three and a half hours, a little less than three and a half hours. That would be crazy. That's with the flip and burn and the deceleration halfway. To get to the average uh, average time to get to Mars would take only about three and a half days. To get to Jupiter, again, the average distance would only take about six and a half days. And to get to Neptune, Neptune would only take 16 days. That is insane. That's less time than it took for old wooden ships to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Even at one third G, which we often see in the show uh, used, there's no reason to, to think that that's because of the strain on the engine. They often use that, I'm going to guess, because it's easier on the bodies of people, especially belters who are used to one third G because the spin is easier, easier to achieve. So even at one third G, constant acceleration with a flip and burn, the time from Earth to the moon is only around six hours. To Mars, it's only around six days. To Jupiter, it's just over 11 days. And for Neptune, it's just short of 28 days at a third G the whole time. Again, that is incredible. And it would really make the entire solar system accessible to us in ways that we really can't comprehend. Now, those are manned ships, which seems to be most cases that we see in the expanse, but surely they have unmanned ships that are just there to send supplies back and forth to different in the solar system. So let's say you had some unmanned ship capable of 10 G acceleration that can do that in a sustained fashion. The trip to the moon would only take an hour. You could do two hour or less delivery to the moon. Again, quite insane. The trip out to Mars would take just slightly over a day. To Jupiter, just two days and Neptune five. So the ability to sort of respond in an emergency would be greatly enhanced or bring supplies out. Again, greatly enhanced. So this would be truly transformative for what we could achieve in the solar system. All right, so this has all been my speculation, but I wanna hear about what you think. What is your theory of how the Epstein drive must work? Is it a primary fusion 
fusion reaction? Is it a secondary fusion reaction? Is it something else? Is it something we haven't discovered at all? How do you think they deal with the byproducts of radiation and neutrons that come off of it? What do you think the implications are for having a drive that powerful? And what do you think that they're missing in the show that we're not seeing? Go ahead and use the hashtag my theory and let us know what you think about the Epstein drive and how it must work. I look forward to reading your comments this week. And I want to say thank you very much for your patience as I was doing some international travel in the last few weeks. I am back to doing the show. I have some more travel coming up at the end of June, but I should keep shows up net between now and then. So thank you very much. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, it would help me a lot if you please click the like button below. If you want to catch future episodes, be sure to click the subscribe button and for notifications, click the bell icon next to subscribe to get a pop up when I post a new show each week. If you think your friends might enjoy the show, please click the share button below to tell them about it on Facebook and Twitter. As always, I'd love to hear your comments on what you heard today, what you enjoyed, if we left something out or if you have something to add. If you've gotten this far in the show, use the hashtag Epstein and I'll know you've gotten all the way to the end. You can also follow me on Twitter at Streamweaver and leave a comment there. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to your theories this week. And as always, stay curious.